you know, social media um, that have uh, also shared astronomy, live astronomy, that kind of thing. I think that we're, if, if we're not the, the most, uh, uh, you know, prevalent one, we're, we're one of. Um, uh, so that's, uh, um, you know, to do a hundred of these things, there is so many, I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of hours, maybe, maybe over a thousand hours of great information uh, from speakers like uh, Gary Palmer, Molly Wakeling, uh, Jason Gonzel, uh, uh, Chuck Ayub has been on the program. Uh, we've had JPL scientists on the program. Next week, we will have uh, the uh, principal astronomer from the SETI uh, Institute. Uh, that's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence in uh, Institute. And uh, uh, I think it's going to be great. He is a fantastic speaker. Uh, his name is Seth Shostak, and uh, so that's just one of the people it's going to be on. But you're going to see a lot of familiar faces uh, coming on next Tuesday. So, are we giving away any prizes? Oh yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so this is the hundredth anniversary, not the hundredth anniversary, the hundredth event. Um, I keep calling it the hundredth anniversary. Uh, uh, we have the IXOS 100 mount, so we will be giving away an IXOS 100. Uh, we have 100 degree eyepieces, so you can expect a couple of those in there. Um, so we will make it special. You know, uh, the uh, for those of you who don't know, the IXOS 100 is a go-to tracker mount. Great right. for uh, if you have a DSLR and a camera lens, you yeah. can get into uh, some tracking, so you're doing longer exposures. Uh, and if you've got like an ED-80 or something like that, uh, right in the wheelhouse uh, for uh, really getting into astrophotography and learning the ropes. It's also, Scott, as you well know, very powerful because you can wire it to a computer and do some incredibly high. oftentimes don't really take our limb seriously and uh, mm -hmm. JR uh, lives down in Louisiana he uh, uh, is running a 180 millimeter Maxitov Cassegrain uh, and camera gear on the Exos 100 uh, running with 24 pounds of gear on his telescope wow. and, and has added extra counterweights get 18 pounds of counterweights uh, oh, man. Doing planetary doing planetary and he's running 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 running. with that rig Planetary, doing planetary astrophotography, uh, working in the 5,400 millimeter focal length range with, yeah. an, with an IXOS 100. Yeah, so it is, you know, a powerful little device that we have out there. So Pekka wanted to know if this is live. Hi, Pekka. How are you? Yes, it's live. It's, I guess, I, I, Scott, the, I think we're running into, because we've been doing some recorded broadcasts that were live. Yeah, we have some. Uh, we, we are broadcasting. It's still, it says live because we're streaming it live. Uh, it, but uh, uh, we have uh, pre-recorded stuff that's out there too, you know, just to, so for the people that have missed a bunch of the other programming we've done. Yeah, it's pre-recorded live. And so it says live, like this broadcast, We'll run this broadcast in the future, and up there it says live, but mm -hmm. but we have a little bug that says pre-recorded on top yeah, of it. Yeah, previously so recorded. I usually previously, stick that yeah. up there. Yeah. Yeah. So but I think if you see that, that, then definitely that's not live. Right. So it's not live, live where Pekka can wave to us, you know, like he is right now. Right. So <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, that's coming up. Uh, you know. This is First Light Chronicles. You know, we have a First Light series of telescopes, which gave its name to this broadcast. And mm -hmm. it's sort of become, how do you get into astronomy and things like that? And, you know, James Webb Space Telescope had First Light yesterday, really on Monday a little bit, but really strongly on Tuesday. 
and um, you know it is a real popularizer and, and draws people to the idea of astronomy and astrophotography. I can do that. Scott, what's your advice for amateur astronomers out there who can capitalize on this moment of people being interested in it and like tonight's the super moon it's a perigee moon so it's yeah. gonna be like 13 or 14 percent closer and 30 percent brighter people have been mm -hmm. asking me about it what's your advice on how we can go about capturing this moment this singular period of time to to get people into the hobby we all love well i mean it's all about communication first off you know so you know these live programs is is a good start but a good step beyond that uh, is the tried and true uh, join your astronomy club, you know, uh, and get involved with them. There are astronomy clubs across the country. Uh, we are strongly tied to the Astronomical League and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, and those two organizations represent, at least in North America, uh, and also uh, with memberships around the world, uh, a very, very strong, um, you know, uh, uh, alliance. Um, they have the league itself, I think, has 300 clubs, over 300 clubs, over 20,000 members. Uh, the Royal the RASC in Canada has uh, several thousand members as well. They're older than the uh, Astronomical League is, but these are these are both organizations that have been around for a while. Um, uh, I think the Astronomical League this year is celebrating their 75th anniversary. And I think that the RASC has been around for over 100 years, maybe like 150 years, something like that. Um, uh, but uh, being involved with an astronomy club is great. What if you can't be involved with an astronomy club, okay? Well, there's nothing to stop you from starting kind of an ad hoc astronomy gathering. Uh, and I, I did that um, a long time ago, and um, uh, literally it was uh, me going out to a street corner, uh, and uh, pretty soon there would be like somebody would kind of hang out with me, and it was just two of us, and then it became four of us, and then it became 20 of us, and then it became 50 of us, and then we had to go find another place to go observe from, uh, which we did, and then eventually that, that group of friends, observing friends, became like 600, okay? Uh, we, I was working at uh, a camera shop called Oceanside Photographic Center at the time. Uh, we sold more and more telescopes and the community got so involved uh, that we changed the name of the store to be called Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Uh, they now go by the, you know, their initials OPT, uh, which uh, you might, might have also shot from them. But, uh, uh, but it's really simple. Uh, in getting involved, you did it yourself, Kent. Uh, how did you get started? I mean, you you had you had a, a father that was kind of uh, very interested, right? Right. Dad um, would take us out, you know, and, and binoculars, or just go out and, and watch meteor showers. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, growing up in the '60s, hang on, I got an earbud falling out. Growing up in the '60s, um, now this one wants to fall out. That was weird. Uh -huh. So, gr growing up in the '60s. Uh, you know, on the north side of a town that had a couple thousand people in it, uh, down in the Arkansas River Valley, the skies were spectacular. And I can, you know, I don't remember them being like they are, but I think that, that memory fades. But I can remember comments Bennett and West in the late 60s and early 70s. That's cool. Just stretching, you know, big not a big, you know, a great comet, you know, a big, bright, obvious uh, nucleus and a big long tail that stretches across the sky. I mean, you know, yeah. the comet Pinstars that's out there, you know, it's it's hard to see it in a telescope, you know, especially right now because of the moonlight. But it's not a big obvious thing. People look up and go, oh, my gosh, there's a comet. Well, with those, people look up and say, oh, my gosh, there's a comet. We haven't had one of those in a long time. But, you know, we would do some try to do some photography on lunar eclipses and things like that. And just, you know, go out and hang out, which I really advocate is a great way to get a kid involved uh, in mm -hmm. astronomy and you know, it may be they go on with life and don't have that interest, but we see this really typically, Scott. People get in their 40s, 30s, 40s, and start getting that hankering for astronomy again and, and get back into it. We see that pattern all yeah. the time. 
Well, that's what Galileo did. did. He got started in astronomy when he turned 45. So, you know, uh, and he had a nice run at it, but <laughs> which still affects yeah. us today. I wonder, I really wonder what was Galileo's childhood like that got him started, interested in stargazing. I can imagine he was out, you know, in Florence or wherever he was and seeing incredible skies back then. I mean, no light pollution to speak of, right? Uh, none, zero light pollution. They, they were, I don't, I mean, how, how much light pollution can you have from- With candles. candles. Yeah, uh, none. <laughs> you know, you might have- the, How much? When the Industrial Revolution gets going, you start having some air pollution that would have affected yeah. that. But you still oh, have yeah. inky black nights. I think his childhood was one of curiosity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's an innate curiosity and a wonder people have. And, you know, if you're curious about things, I mean, he had to be curious about the telescope because he was like, wow. And, and he thought, well, I wonder what the sky looks like with this. And he looked at Jupiter and went, wow, look at that, you know. Uh, he just, you know, he, he looked at the sun and observed sunspots. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it's it just, I think it's just being curious. And Scott, we saw this on Friday, had a couple come in the store. And uh, uh, the, the wife was wanting to buy a telescope and mount for her husband for their wedding anniversary. And we were talking to them and they, you know, they're, they're not rushing to buy something. And they live up in a fairly dark part of southwest Missouri, live an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you and I were going, and a, and a group of us were going to a place in Bentonville, a, a, a bicycler bar uh, and restaurant to do uh, outreach. And I told them about a good barbecue restaurant in Bentonville and where we're going. I said, come by. And they show up. Scott, you saw this happen. She looks in, in a telescope at the sun, and he looks at it. And she stands up and she's like in awe. And then yeah, yeah. a little bit darker, we put a 16 inch telescope on the moon. And I wasn't over there with you, but Scott, you told me she took over the telescope and started showing. She took over ideas. the telescope. I, I, we showed her how to use, you know, focus it, move the telescope and all the rest of it. We just showed her once and then she's like off and running. And, uh, and then she's sitting back with her husband. The husband was supposed to be the guy that was really into it and very interested. I mean, they drove down from another state to be there for this, okay? Um, <laughs> and she, and this this older guy comes up, and he, she can see that he doesn't know really how to look into the telescope. And she goes up and shows him how to focus it, how to center up the moon, how to do all this stuff. And, I mean, she owned it at that point, you know, so. She was all in. Cool. She was all in. <laughs> she was all she in. Was so all she in. went over what I call the tipping point really fast, you know. So that yeah. night she I, was she was born reborn as an astronomer. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. She was, you know, and I was talking some technical stuff, how the mounts work and the go to works and things, mm -hmm. and she was like, mm -hmm. but but when she saw the sun, and saw sunspots, she was full of questions. Yeah, that blew her away. And then when she saw the moon through a 16-inch Newtonian or Dobsonian telescope, I, she was hooked deep. And she, I think she's hooked. She, she actually messaged Saturday and said, hmm. you were talking about that star party in Arizona. When is it? Because we're going. And so, <laughs> you know, just like, and it wasn't him. It wasn't Eric doing all this. It was Stephanie. Yeah, Eric she was kind of quiet so the entire time. The, his wife was really, uh, that was great. That's great. Yeah, it was. Becca, it was. Becca is uh, mentioning about his first experience. I'll read it to you. He says, my dad was also very interested in astronomy. And if he hadn't bought those first binoculars for me 47 years ago, I don't know what would uh, uh, what I would observe with. But astronomers, uh, but an astronomer would I be what so for, I, yeah, he's saying for, you know, for, from now on, you know, basically that's when he became an astronomer, and he, he thinks it's in he thinks it's in the DNA. Um, and then Pekka wants you to know, know when he can send his congratulation video for the hundred. Send it in today if you can. That's great. Yeah, Pekka's been on multiple times as well, so you know, uh, for yes, sure. He has. Oh, and we were talking, but we were talking about OPT. They're an authorized explorer scientific dealer. 
Well, there you go. A little plug for them. Oh, so yeah. uh, support the dealers. Well, the first support one the is actually. Yeah. So Scott, you know, back to, uh, go to the first light, you know, the James West Space Telescope. Yeah. You know, one thing, you know, I think is important to discuss <clears throat> is why it's so much better and how, you know, because all the talk, well, it, it's an infrared <clears throat> telescope. And well, why does that work? And Paul, pull up that graphic, if you would, please. Which one? The, the Sophie, the infrared from Sophie. So there it is. There we go. And Scott disappeared. Nice. Oh, Scott okay. is magic. He made himself disappear. Okay. So what you're looking at is obviously a constellation of Orion uh -huh. in the visible light. And then you're seeing it in infrared. And so why is infrared better than visible light? Well, down below that, you can see a spectrum with high energy gamma rays on the left. And then it moves to X-rays and UV. And then it shows you the visible wavelength in the, the, the spectrum of the rainbow. And then on the red side of the rainbow, it goes into the infrared. And then it goes into um, radio waves, OK? So if you start, it turns out that most interstellar dust is about the diameter of the wavelength of light which means the light runs into all that dust and scatters. So visible light becomes opaque or just totally dissipates when it runs into clouds of interstellar dust. The long wavelengths of that infrared light, it go right through that, inf go right through it. It doesn't care, it just passes right through. So when we start looking at the sky infrared, we're seeing things in wavelengths that our eyes can't see, but the cameras can capture. And, mm -hmm. you know, the James West Space Telescope has a very large aperture, extremely sensitive, you know, very small pixels, giving it some really, really high definition. And that has allowed uh, us to see what was literally invisible to us before. And it brings the visible, the invisible, visible. You know, I read somewhere, and I've thought of this, if we could see the night sky, night sky in infrared, it would be an astounding thing to see because around Orion, there's so much infrared and far red glowing. I mean, it'd just be spectacular. But that's why the infrared is important, and that's why we can see through these interstellar dust clouds uh, because those long wavelengths just go right through it. And so uh, let's go on to some of those images. We've all seen them. Um, but, Paul, you want to pull one up? There we go. Is this uh, Stefan's Quintet? Paul? Uh, I'm yes. Yes, it is. Technical yes, it is. stuff on my end. Yes, it is. So I, I wish I'd had time to get the Hubble images scaled uh, and put beside them, but they're out there. Uh, you know, I found one on, I'll give a plug for it, NBC News, where they have some JavaScript sliders so you can slide back and forth. The differences are astounding. It's like going from, uh, for those of you old enough to remember, it's like going from a, a 110 camera to a 6x6 six six camera. I mean, 110 was the size of your pinky fingernail, you know, if you remember that film camera. And going to a large format camera, the differences are truly astounding. The sharpness, the detail, and what you can see, but that deep field. Oh, yeah. yeah, this comparison, that they were showing the Hubble Space Telescope uh, comparison yesterday on Global Star Party. Uh, no, I'll just say there was no comparison. You could see the same uh, outlying shapes and stuff like that, but not to this detail. This looks like, uh, gosh, uh, it looks like an ocean wave with incredibly sharp uh, ripples and stuff. And there's this is a region of star birth. Uh, all these tiny little knots that you see here have embryonic stars in them. Uh, planetary formation is happening. There are disks of rotating dust around stars. Uh, it's, it's absolutely spectacular. Yeah, it's, it's just, 
I, I wish I would have had time to get the comparison images together. I just didn't. But yeah. it's it's like night and it's like it's like you had Vaseline smeared on your camera lens. And Scott, I know you did that uh, to shoot por for, portfolio uh, uh, portrait photos to try and soften things a little bit. Yeah. I certainly Check this did out. that. So I downloaded the full res version. Okay, yeah. yeah, I want to see that of the Hubble Deep Field or the James West first deep field. Here we go. Too. So here we go. Go to Birch. So see how far I went in? Oh yeah. yeah. For Can a you go JPEG. More? Yeah, it's Actually amazing. it's a PNG, it's but I mean, we're in. That's pretty deep. Yeah, so let's go to that Hubble Deep Field and talk about it for a minute. Which one is that exactly? The one with the big square one with all the stars in it, the arcs and stuff. Oh, oh, oh. I'm gonna have. I didn't get to pull time to pull that one down yet. So, okay. Let me so, get to it on the web browser. Well, one one thing that I that that we hasn't seen a whole lot of press and people haven't been talking about on Facebook before the press conference. Uh, on President Biden's press conference, I predicted on Facebook that the specter <clears throat> of the star of the exoplanet that they took was going to show presence of uh, hydrogen, oxygen, water, and carbon. Well, they didn't have any carbon, but it showed a very, very strong spectral line for water. And the importance of that the implications are immense because where there's water, there's probably life. And you know, the I know that they pick the best candidate for it. It's a, a, it's a big Jupiter. It's in the Goldilocks zone. It's not super hot, so they picked one that they knew probably was going to have a strong signature of water because of where it was. But mm -hmm. it is awesome that they the first one, the first specter they got. At least the first specter they almost released, got it has water in it because that is super significant to the potential for being some version of life out there. You know, if you start extrapolating it to, you know, we there were there were billions of galaxies. Now there's trillions of billions of galaxies because this uh, deep field image that Paul's getting ready to bring up, as we all probably have heard is an area of the sky that's the size of a grain of sand at arm's length. And every dot that doesn't have spikes on it is a galaxy. And it's just truly astounding when you zoom into this thing. All those little arcs are, are lens galaxies from that large galaxy cluster right in the center. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, and, and so... It's it's Give me just a and second, and I'll have an stars. even bigger yeah. image. Uh, yeah. Almost stars every dot fine. in there is a galaxy. I mean, it's yeah. every if it doesn't have a spike from one. Of it, if it, exactly, it's a star. It's a galaxy. It's a galaxy. Now remember, get ready. Remember, that's that's a sky the size of a gra angular size of a grain of sand, at, uh -huh. at three feet from you, and imagine that all over the sky you know how many grains of sand will it take to cover the sky and it's all there it's just everything with a spike is a star that's in the milky way everything without a spike is a galaxy so that's the lensing galaxy right there in the very middle it's a i think there's like five of galaxy cluster like five three or four Look at that. galaxies yeah, There's a spiral galaxy on. right there. Yeah, that's obviously pretty close. But look at over the yeah. left. Those and are, that, that one galaxy could be hundreds of billions of stars or a trillion stars. Yeah, probably every star has, or most of the stars have planets. And that's just one. Look at that. I mean, look how far deep, how deeply you can see in this. It's crazy. Yeah, look, and this is, and Scott, this is only twelve and a half hours of, of time. The yeah. longer they stare at this spot, yeah. The if they did the hundred-hour Wade Prunty special, and yeah, I mean, even it would if be... they do the Hubble, the first Hubble deep field was was twelve, eleven and a, eleven wow. and a half days. What's going on there? Days? Where? What are you looking at? See the blob? 
put your cursor on it. I Which can, blob? The cursor doesn't. Flip There's my many. Cursor. No, it you're looks talking about like that, that kind of orange-looking stretched-out thing over one of the. Yeah. Yeah, that is a that is a gravitationally lens galaxy. Isn't it cool? So, it is so what that cool. means is, Paul, there's a background galaxy that's vastly yes. farther away, 13 or 14 billion light years away, that's being a very early galaxy formed in, after the Big Bang, that's being gravitationally lensed and bent and magnified by this uh, big star cluster in the very center of this image. And so it allows us to see much, much farther in the past than we would otherwise. And we've been looking at lens galaxies for a long time. And there's, there's actually people who go through and analyze them and then put them back together and assemble a picture of what the galaxy looks like. And so I'm sure there's people working on this right now. Like right there, that big smear that yeah. goes off counter, you know, like a circle going I wonder the if that's the telescope. No, it can't no. be, can it? No. Because no, there's that's... other things that aren't smeared. Right. That's the light being pushed Bent. around, pushed and pulled. Bent, Gra gravitationally linked by that. By yeah. gravity. Yeah, it's crazy. By gravity, by the massive gravity. Look at Which... all those galaxies, man. Which Einstein One, two, predicted? One, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, just, just 10, in the 11, field right 12. here. You can just go on and on and on. Yeah, and so let me show you how little... much I've zoomed in. Okay, let me put it right back in the middle. How about and that? Just start zooming in now. Just start zooming in now. Again. I can only take it so far with this software. Yeah, but go as far as you can. That's it. So every single white dot you see There's tons. is a galaxy, is a galaxy. And there's there's astounding number of little faint white dots in here that just blow my mind. How much, which I'm so, not surprised. So there let's just say we have a telescope that can do four times this into space. And we see this galaxy, and on that galaxy, there's a little planet. And on that little planet, there's a bunch of people. It wouldn't matter anyway, because that was how many billions of years ago? Uh, this goes back to more than 13 billion years. Yeah. So if you matter. wave now. <laughs> <laughs> because if I could see that. I would have messed my pants, okay? And then, <laughs> even though it happened 13 billion years ago, so. <laughs> you know, can't go just, visit. I wouldn't go, oh, yeah, that just, just it happened I a long time ago. It doesn't matter. Just can't go visit. That's all. It would have you blown know, my it's mind. Just, it's, it's the idea, it's just the scale of, of what's out there is very difficult for we mere mortals to be able to comprehend. The distances, you know, like for instance, you know, if you're going to fly a 747 to the moon, it takes 16 days to get there at the speed of an of, of, a, of a 747, you know, and that's just, and you thought a, a flight to Hong Kong, Scott, is what, is what, 16 hours, you know, from no, here, 16 yeah, day. yeah, from here, 16 yeah, hours from, here. from from central United States to Hong Kong, 16 yeah. hours. We're talking about. 16 days to I get just to the moon. Really like this. This is this is nice. You like that? Yeah. Okay, so Paul, I'm emailing you a link that Harold Locke sent to me, and this is from the uh, Big Think website. So this is a uh, there's a guy named um, Ethan uh, Ethan Siegel, and he is a science popularizer, uh, a PhD. Uh, physicist and uh, he is amazing in his explanations and he writes a blog he does uh, video programs and stuff like that I'm going to see if one day I can get, actually get him on one of our programs but um, yeah you should show this because it shows the uh, the comparisons that um, Kent was looking for working on it uh, thank you Harold for passing that along to us you know the comparison it's just it's it's like explaining what the sunspots look like 
and then looking at the sunspots. The difference is just immense. Or explaining really what an eclipse is like and actually seeing one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's just you can't do it. It's hard. To, it's just hard. Right. But but I think you know we as amateur astronomers need to seize on these moments and and educate yourself a little bit and and talk about what you understand and, and say I don't know. You know, there's times mm -hmm. I say I say I don't know because or that's not anywhere that I've done any reading on because. I, I can I try and wing it, well, BS it, or, and I'm going to get caught and, and um, club it up, and I don't want to be wrong or that wrong anyway. You know, so, but uh, we're not. You know, it's it's hard to go out and look at the full moon tonight, you know, because it's going to be bright through a telescope. But go out and just. My, my wife is over at a friend's house, I'm and not a they're having going to turn the the uh, lights in the swimming pool off and lights in the backyard off, and just swim and watch the the moon rise. You know, tonight, and just here we go. Uh, Ready? Visually enjoy it. Boom. There you go. Yeah. So, what are we looking at here, Paul? You're looking at the website. What is the? Does it say what the uh, images are here? This is the James Webb's first science images before and after from the Big Think website. Uh, now that it's fully commissioned, the James Webb Space Telescope begins its exploration of the universe, and here are its first science images. Uh, so it's not saying, I think the top one is a Hubble, and no. I think the middle and bottom ones are James West. No, the three panel, let me look here, it's, it's really opaque, so I've got to get in there and really... Uh, the th this three panel image shows the views of the Carina Nebula's cosmic cliff seen by, you're right, the Hubble, um, JWST's near cam instrument, and JWST's MIRI instrument. With its okay, first science release yeah. upon us, the new era in astronomy has truly arrived. Sorry. Yes. So look at that dust. <laughs> look at the dust. You know, these are not scaled exactly the same, I don't think. But but look at the dust in the top one, the little clouds. Which when we saw those images, Scott, from the Hubble, yeah. It, yeah. it was jaw dropping. You know. But but as people were teasing you know I, mean, I was hopeful, but you think the Hubble you know, images are jaw dropping? Well, Wait until you see the JWST because it's, it's going to make the Hubble serious. pictures look like yeah, just snapshots, too, and that's that's the case, absolutely the case. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Well, and I have that world. image. Uh, let's just go. Cool. This is the full full res image released uh, in its. It's another one of those that I can just zoom forever and the detail stays. How big is this a TIFF or a JPEG? Did you download I got this? it as a PNG because okay, so uh, TIFFs don't work well in the software. This particular oh, okay. image is 47.8 megs. Uh, How am I going to do show and be on the show? Yeah. Its dimensions are 11,264 by 3,904. That puts Thanks. it at 7K, 8K. So it's pretty pretty big. Zoom in there, Paul. Working on it. I mean, we're in there tight. No, you're just the... Here's the Just in. incredible, incredible detail. You know, some artifacts in a couple of places. Well, sure. Just, yeah, fantastic. Just, can you slide it to the left or up or down or something to go up? I can't. I can't. Right now, right now let me put you guys back up on screen. And, and Paul, you said There's this is the Eta Carina. Huh? This is the Eta Carina Nebula, correct? The one that you were, we were just looking at. With the comparisons yeah. from Hubble. Yeah. What's this one? Does it say? This is this is uh, with James same, Webb. Same thing. This is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Here's a good question from Becca. He says, "Do you think that J West 
pictures will affect our thoughts on how deep into space we amateur astronomers can go. I mean, will we change our seeing what uh, to image in the future? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes and yes. yes. <laughs> because, Hubble Space look, Telescope did yeah. that, and, and Palomar, the Palomar 200-inch telescope did that, and the 100-inch at Mount Wilson did that. And so, uh, yeah, every landmark telescope uh, you know, that becomes the new thing to benchmark against. And um, so, you, and the thing that's, that's true, and, and, and Pekka, you know this, the, the, once you show amateurs something that's out there, okay, uh, amateurs will figure out a way to image it, not, not to this detail and resolution,
G11 with PMC8. I feel sorry for The only thing I don't all. have right now is the PMC8, <laughs> and you can't see it, so it's okay. And, and you can't so we're going to talk you, about you telescopes. Oh, I have one here in this brown box. It is the beautiful 152 carbon fiber, and yes, it is. It looks massive, but I promise you, it's lightweight, and that's the beauty part about it. Is it is a huge, huge telescope. It's it's almost six feet long. It's like a wind sail. But I'm telling you, the thing captures so much immaculate detail, it is insane. Uh, it is the TED 152-208-CF. You mean the mount? No, the telescope. Oh. It's in the box. We're going we're gonna to kind of do an unboxing during the Amazon Live. You I know? didn't know you had it. didn't yeah. have it out of the box yet. Yeah, I don't have it out of the box yet. I'm going to save that for the, the, the viewers that want to come to the Amazon Live. So I can't see anything that Paul's saying because I've got blinding lights in front of me. All right, hang on. I'm hang on. Mute for a second. Mute. No. Oh well, it's hot. I'm sorry. I apologize. I will refrain. <laughs> I will refrain. I'm muted. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk about the benefits of a Laws Mandy G11 with PMC8. Uh, the, also the benefits of the Exos 2 with PMC8, you know, and we're also going to talk about this wonderful beauty. Everybody knows, I kind of call this one the flagship. I know some people may or may disagree or agree with me, but the 127 um, Essential Series for sure. Uh, it's 952 millimeters of focal length, which is great for deep sky objects, if you put a reducer on it, it's even great for wide field. It can be used kind of for planetary if you're using a focal extender or a Barlow or a PowerMate, whichever that you want to actually introduce into the optical train. Um, and it's, it's, it's my go-to scope. Um, I have the carbon fiber version, of course, the FCD100, um, but this is a great, great starter scope for a beginner or in an, in, there's not really an expert in the amateur astronomy community, and I don't think, but unless you classify a scientist, the expert, because they're very, very smart. Scott um, would be considered an expert. Scott, Scott is definitely an expert. I would completely agree with you, Paul. Um, but we'll talk about the ins and outs of both of these systems, what makes them tick other than the PMC-8, why was it originally designed, um, and load capacities, you know, because everybody wants to know the load capacities, because uh, everybody... Billion pounds. Billion pounds. Well, the, the G11 is supposedly, on paper, uh, able to handle 60 pounds. Um, the way this thing is machined <laughs> probably can hold a whole lot more than that, to well, be honest. Well, you, you don't want to break the warranty, but if you balance it correctly, exactly. it can hold a lot. It can. If you have enough counterweight for the counterbalance, um, then you'll, be, you'll honestly but be But you fine. have to be dead on or you're going to break some. You're going to definitely burn the motor uh, or tear the gears of the worm, the teeth of the worm. Um, but yeah, the, 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 one, well, the 152 is, like I said, it's a big, it's a long scope. Um, and I'll actually, I won't be able to mount it on the G11 because it will literally stick way past everything. But if, once I lower the G11, uh, you'll actually, I'll turn the deck and then you'll see how long it actually is with the dew shield extended. It's pretty big. Um, it does come with a three inch focuser. That's right, three inch focuser, three inch. That is huge. Uh, most telescopes don't might really- Might need an adapter. Might need an adapter, but here's the beauty part. You do have the ability to go to a two inch, so it goes from three inch to two inch. So you can use a two inch diagonal, so you can use it for viewing pleasure. Um, or you can just throw in the three inch reducer, or the FFFR, if you wanted to. And that way you can actually use the full capabilities of the three inch and not have to worry about anything. And that's the beauty part. In my f uh, hey, Mr. Connor, how you doing, sir? My five-inch F5 reflector with a 24 Explorer Scientific. <laughs> you can't see the Veil Nebula. That's the beauty part. It's hydrogen alpha and O3. Uh, 
depending on your light pollution, you possibly might see it, but if you're in a heavily light polluted area, I can't see it from my F6 backyard, unless I have a telescope on it with a camera. I cannot see it visually. Um, plus the star that's in the west or the east, you know, western veil, the witch's broom, it's very, very bright. And that's, that's, the, that's the unfortunate benefit of it. But there are, I, would, I haven't experimented with filters enough other than the LRGB and SHOs. Um, I know light pollution with a camera can pick it up, but it's very faint. Uh, hydrogen alpha in a narrow band will pick it up quickly with just a 10 second exposure. Um, the longer you increase that exposure, of course, the more detail that you're going to gather. That's a whole other wonderful show. But 6824 Bradley in your F5 actually will be a good, um, I call it a star hopper um, eyepiece. Now, what a star hopping eyepiece is, is used for is, so say you got your telescope set up. I'm going to have to turn this around real quick. I'm going to loosen the dovetail or the clamps. So I turned it around. I'm loosen the deck. Paul, can you see that right here in the mm -hmm. wide angle? Sure. So you got your, your dovetail. Um, you'll have your straight through or your, R, your right angle corrected imager or your right angle finder. You got your eyepiece here. So what I see in here, my, my 9 by 50, 8 by 50, whichever you have, I should theoretically see it in the eyepiece. This is going to give me a much uh, wider field of view, an 8 by 50 compared to the uh, 2468, but I would use this eyepiece uh, for star hopping. That way if I'm looking at Lyra, uh, the constellation Lyra, and I want to find uh, M1, uh, that I would use the spotting scope or the, the, the right angle finder to get in the area where I'm needing to be, and then I would use the eyepiece to finer detail by looking at star patterns. Um, usually I have a star map out, which uh, I don't have it with me, but Kent has this giant star atlas. Are you talking about that? No. No, no, no. That's just a planisphere. But oh. I can still use it, none the same. Good thinking, Paul. So we have, turn it here, turn it here, Big Dipper, Ursa Major Leo. Da -da 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 -da. Gotta get my constellations. Constellations, where is Lyra? Where are you at, Virgo, Leo, Sickle, Cancer, Such Hydra? Such a weirdo. Sometimes. I know. This is how I actually learn it. I know. By singing I'm just, it? By singing it. It's amazing what you can do when you can sing it. Uh-huh. There it is, right there. A so, B C we got Lyra. And I'm sorry, it's M57, not M1. So, I know where Vega is. Granted, this is not in the correct orientation. I'm just showing in general. So, I know where Vega is. So, I start... And that's where I put my um, right, angle, right angle image corrected thing, the RACI. I put it there, and then I use the eyepiece, and I walk down to the, the bottom star. Can't see it. I know. Uh, hang on. Glare. Let me, I mean, glare. Is that better? No, it's worse. Worse? Better? You're good where you were. You just got to watch where you tip it. How about that? Is that even better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that better? Good. Now I got to find. Okay, so we got Vega down here at the bottom. We hop over to the next star, and then I use the eyepiece and hop over to the next one. And I know it's in between those two stars. Kent would know the name of the stars. I don't know the name of the stars. I'm terrible, I know. And then I know it's right in between those two stars in the constellation Lyra. So I would use my right angle finder to get a starting point, and then I would use the eyepiece to star hop back and forth to find the orientation and the star pattern. And so I would just literally go down the ladder and, and just star hop. Um, there's a lot of people that use a lot bigger eyepieces. Um, and then some people just switch to narrower and narrower or higher, higher magnification or higher power to get a lot closer. Um, so go ahead. Tyler is a tad bit excited. One, because he was almost late. Yeah, that's true. And two, we've got some interesting news we that got may some or very may not. interesting news. Ugh. Breaking That's, stuff. No, it's just the felt. Ah, planet sphere. Thank you, Noah. So, me and Paul have. Paul and I, you mean? Me and Paul. I'm giving you all the credit. <laughs> I'm just fixing I had to do your... the reach. I had to do the reaching out, not you. Just do it. I, I Paul and I, me, myself, and Paul and I. Uh, I'm just fixing your grammar. Your we had 
Paul had an epiphany, or more of a thought, and he thought that with a cinema camera, specifically a red, what is it, a red V Raptor? Yeah, Ved, Ved, Red <laughs> V Raptor. I yes. hear myself in the headphones when I talk, so yep. it messes with me occasionally. Yeah, I don't blame you. It would mess with me too if I had to hear your voice in my head. Uh, you do, it and you know 8K, it. It right? shoots 8K, right? 8K at 100? No. Yeah, it shoots 8K, mm -hmm. um, but 17. I thought it was 18. Is it 8, 17, 17 stops? to 18 stops of dynamic range. It's insane. Yeah. So, so what was that, Thursday or Friday? Friday was, last week, Thursday. It, it Thursday. was Thursday of last week. So I was like, th these are expensive cameras. They're 45000 to and up, depending on what you're getting. Yeah. Um, so these I are the same it, ones that they shoot all your Hollywood movies on. Yeah. Well, so not all of them. I mean, you have other cameras. You've got the Panavision, which is for film. film. And then you've we'll, got we'll the Arri Alexa, 90%. which is <laughs> what they shoot James Bond on. <laughs> And, and then you've got you've the got red camera. If you've ever seen an mm -hmm. episode of Supernatural, that's all mm -hmm. shot on red because it's so, dark. So the main purpose of this camera is it's an excellent candidate for low light photography. Like 17 stops of dynamic range. This thing will hold, literally, there's a video out there because Paul showed me that a guy's literally got cameras, cameras that are lit and placed in, throughout the room and they're literally lighting up his whole face like it's j like this. Candles. It is insane. Candles. Just candles. Low, soft, white, soft, soft light candles. Um, I just got off the phone with them about thir about 20 minutes ago. They're going to send me one, to, well, send us one to test. Send us, yeah. Send us one to test. Uh, so that's... So we're gonna, we're gonna strap that awesome. dude on a telescope, on a telescope. and <laughs> we're gonna put it on a telescope. I'm gonna put it on a tracker. We're gonna see what this thing can actually do, um, and then report back to them, and, and you know, and just blow it up with publicity because it's their newest camera, if I'm right. Yeah, correct, Paul. It's, it's their cheapest one to date. That's still just <laughs> as good $40, as forty thousand dollars is the cheapest one to date. Yeah, no, I mean, the last time I priced them, they were two hundred thousand. It's true. That was what a year, less than a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago. Anyway, it was it was very expensive, so I'm kind of excited about that. Yes, I'm going to take a cinema camera and use it for dedicated astronomy, and Paul's going to use it for videoing. <laughs> so we're going to. It's native well. ISO is like 3200. So there's That's zero noise, noise at 3200 ISO. That is that is honestly nuts. So yeah, that's, that's mainly what we're going to be talking about on the show today um, on the Amazon Live. We're going to be talking about the, the benefits of a Laws Manny G11. Why would you want one? You know, uh, they do serve their purposes. Yes, it is very heavy, but with the, the basics of this one, you have the ability to break it down in three pieces. You have the RA clutches here to remove the RA. That way this whole, or I'm sorry, the deck, that way the whole deck comes off. You can tote it around, they're around 30 pounds. Same with the, the RA. The RA has got three bolts that are around the area. You loosen them up, turn, slide, pick up, you're done. It's another 30 pounds and the tripod folds up nice and tight, um, out of sight and out of mind. Um, same, well, and with the Exos 2 PMCA, it's literally just a head mount, but these are light enough compared to this bad boy that you can literally just pick, I can pick it up with just a telescope and move it around. Don't recommend it, but it can be done if you need to move in a pinch. Um, always make sure when you move mounts, you need to take the counterweights off. You need to take the counterweights off. Um, the reason why I have this counterweight on is because I'm fixing to put on the big boy, uh, the 152. So please make sure you tune in on Amazon because I'm going to unbox it. You're going to see what you get. Yeah, um, so I mean, that's pretty much this episode. Um, and why you're wanting to get something like a 152, you know, what's the beneficial purpose? Same with a 127, why do you want to get a 127, you know? Um, I mean, do you want to get the, because it's got some reach? Do you want to get it because it's light? Do you want to get it because it just says explore scientific? Who knows? I mean, this, like I said before, in my opinion, take it with a grain of salt. This is, the, I, I consider this our flagship um, of telescopes. Uh, there's a lot of great images out there that's with this telescope. There's a lot of people that have this telescope that just love it. Um, it's honestly the easiest thing to set up. It's the lightest thing to set up. 
The 152 is a little bit more cumbersome. Uh, it's 28, I think it's, no, it's 22 pounds actually. And, and you're gonna be amazed. I mean, granted it is carbon fiber, but you're gonna be shock and awe because as big and massive as it is, you're like, that. there's no way that weighs 22 pounds. But I promise you it does. Um, that's why we always put it on the Laws Mandy G11. You can put it on the Exos 2 as well because the, the payload capacity of this one's 28 pounds and this one's 60. <clears throat> you always want to try to get the biggest mount that you can afford. Uh, that way you can just grow into it. Um, think of it as a house. You want to have a great foundation because if you have a poo foundation, you're <laughs> not going to get good results. You know what they, I, they, they tell us in the photography world? Whatever yeah. your camera costs, Double you it need to, no, no. no. <laughs> half of that should be the cost of your tripod. Well, I mean, that's crazy because $3,000 camera, just the body, is yeah, a $1,500 $1, tripod. I'm, that's an expensive tripod too. That's, that's the big daddy of all boss daddies. Yeah. Sorry, could you say that again? No. Say it again, Stinkin Tyler. Siri. Say it again. Stinking Siri. She interrupts me all the time. But no, I mean, with, with the you Laws Mandy comes You turn that off, with, right? I did. I just did. I apologize. Well, no, with the Laws Mandy the comes with, yeah, with Laws Mandy comes with three-inch tripod legs. So she's got a lot of stability for sure. And I have it all the way up. And that's why it's as tall as me. Um, I, when, I, when we do the Amazon live show, when you come back, it's going to be lower. Uh, we'll have the telescope. Uh, I'll probably have it out of the box, and I'll probably just put it here on the floor. That just makes it easier for me to just to grab it and go and then do whatever I need to do. So, yeah, that's, that's today's Facebook show. Uh, you to cut it off early? I'm going to cut it off early because, A, I need to go to the bathroom. B, I need some water. And, yeah, that's, that's fun. That way I can make sure I have everything ready for the Amazon show. That's okay. I have to, I've yeah, got a I technical to, glitch anyway. I've got to reboot everything. Yeah, so there you go. So I'm giving time for everybody because I'm sh caring for once. So guys, make sure you tune in at 2 o'clock Central Standard I, Time. I, that's, I don't believe I don't. that at all. I know you don't, but it's a thought that counts, isn't it? For the Amazon no. Live Show, we're going to talk about these bad boys and then big old We'll telescope. stream it on Facebook and of course. YouTube as well, so you can catch it Of course it there. we will. But we'd prefer, we prefer you to watch it on Amazon for the yes. fact that when you watch it on Amazon, we get a better algorithm response and we can actually uh, level up. And the more we level up, the more people they show it level to. Up. It's a video game, level up. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the more people they show it to, which means the more people we expose mm -hmm. to this, uh, to astrophotography Genre. and yep. astronomy and science, um, and maybe we might make somebody smarter. Maybe? Not with me. You're pretty dumb. I'll just make them understand it. <laughs> you guys take care. We'll see you at 2 o'clock on Amazon Live. Y'all take care. Smile, Tyler. Smile, Tyler. <laughs>